What's up, everybody? Justin, he's connecting, 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 connecting. Farts. What's up? I love the farts guy. Uh oh. Let's try it again. See what's happening. And waiting for Justin Pearson 31G. Justin Pearson. Hey, man. Holy shit. How Good you to doing? see you, dude. Good to see you as well. How's it going, man? Um, it's going. Yeah. Something. <laughs> Something like life. We're here. Yeah. Right? Um, well, thank you for coming on to the age of quarantine. Sure. Good to see you. Um, wow, national holiday today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Everything is sort of uh, just blending. We're blending right now. Days, nights, we're all blending. Um, so, Justin, I'm going to start this interview off very simply. Um, I do every single one, which is if you weren't at home, where would you be? Do you know? No, I don't. Not, not at this point. I mean, man. It's I don't this know. been going on for a while now, so it's a hard question. Sure. I, I can never really even figure out what day it is of the week, but um, initially, like, I had, f I think, four tours canceled now, so, so like, I might have been on tour. I, I'm pretty sure I probably would have been on tour, maybe. Yeah. It's safe to say that you would have been on tour with one of your, your many, many, many bands. No, I mean, it was, I'm, on, I'm only in, I'm only in four bands. <laughs> I'm only in four. Guys, it's not that serious. I'm only in four bands right now. Well, it's not, yeah, it's not as complicated as it sounds, I guess. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably not. I mean, I guess you've been, and then you got the label, you got a lot of stuff going on. But yeah, like, I'm not saying I don't have stuff to do. I'm just saying it's not like I'm, not, I'm like not in four full time bands all at once. You know, yeah, like for sure. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's kind of all of them turn on and off and on and off, sort of, right? Yeah, um, not by my choice, but yeah, that's that's how it works. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I just want to let's let's start from the top. Uh, did you, <laughs> you grow up in San Diego? I've lived here since I was twelve, so I would say yes. I mean, and also too, I lived in so I lived in Phoenix for the first 12 years of my life. And I would come to San Diego once a year. <clears throat> we call them zonies. Um, when, when, when you live here and people from Arizona come over, they're called zonies. So I was a zonie for 12 years and then became a resident. So I know how it is, but yeah, I mean, I, I've been in San Diego my whole life. Got it. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's what I associate you with. And then, you know, go, going back, you're like, Oh, certain people, you know, the scene that they come from is not necessarily where they're from per se. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How many bands from Brooklyn, right? So you're kind of like, okay. Um, so what was it like growing up in San Diego? And when were, what were your kind of earlier experiences with music? Um, it's weird because like, I, <clears throat> like I, in Arizona, I got into music like at an early age, but like never really start. I mean, I went to a couple shows, but I moved here when I was 12. So I went to a couple shows like as a child or whatever. And then <clears throat> when I moved here, um, I ended up, Actually, before I moved here, like when my mom was planning on moving us here, I came and saw the Cramps play. And, and that was kind of like really what set me on this path. You know, I, m I remember like hanging out with them and, and it was like a pretty substantial show for me to go to as a 12 year old. I think it without realizing it, you know, and then and then soon after that, I was like met people in bands that were a bit older and, and started hanging out with like people that were, you know, playing live shows and then going and seeing their bands. And then before I knew it, I was playing in a band. Like, I think 15 was when I first started my, my, my first band, so. Oh, wow. So you, you, you were pretty early on. And uh, I mean, what a, what a band to fucking see the first kind of go around, you know. If anyone, you know, if any of our listeners, you know, watch the cramps when they play the Insane Asylum. It's still one of the great videos, I think, on the internet. Yeah. Well, it's a trip because <clears throat> I think, like, I already liked them and seen them and this, you know, obviously before the internet. So there was like, I, I had seen like footage of them on like VHS tapes and stuff, but like going and seeing them for one, I was pretty glad. Like my, my mom wasn't paying attention. Cause it was, it was pretty crazy, you know, to see like a dude in patent leather pants, like shoving his mic down his pants and stuff. And, you know, and it was, it was pretty intense. Like even for me being exposed to that, I was so really excited, but trying to take it all in, you know, and <clears throat> I remember like, 
standing next to these the giant PA up front because I just I wanted to see like everything as best as possible and I stood next to this um, PA like blasting in my ear and never really knowing like oh I probably should have ear protection so I remember like going home and just being fucked like my 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 equilibrium was off and stuff and I was like wow okay well that's that's an experience you know and and um yeah and then shortly after like started like you know seeing all these I've seen, I've seen a ton of bands and then also too like in that in that, in that time <clears throat> um we're really close to Tijuana like it's like a 20 minute trolley ride down there mm. to the border and and there used to be this place called Iguanas that had shows and literally every band you could think of played there so like Man, you know, I saw like GBH, War, Agnostic Front, like uh, and Rose and Tijuana. Yeah, yeah, Circle Jerks. And it, the weirdest thing is because there was a lot of neo Nazis in San Diego, so there was like all these neo Nazis in Mexico acting like total shitheads. So it was it was weird, man. But like, um, I had gotten a fake ID that said I was eighteen because you had to be eighteen to get in there, and they didn't really give a shit, you know. But like. I don't, I don't know. I got an 18, I got an ID that said I was 18. I was actually 13 and I used that to get into the shows. And then it got to the point where like, I mean, being a 13 year old, I couldn't afford the tickets to get in. So, so we figured out a way to like climb this wall. It was totally insane. You know, like, like it was not right for like a child to be down there. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. And then uh, one time I went to see Filth play when I was 14, I went with Matt Anderson from Gravity Records. And I think Rick Farr or Rick Froberg from Driving J who was with us, but everybody was on mushrooms except me. And I remember like they got super fucked up at this show and we were waiting for Filth to play and the DEA raided the, the venue and like started arresting people. <clears throat> and they shot this dude that tried to climb out the window of the bathroom. So right before they shot the guy, they figured out that I had a fake ID and they were like, oh, you're going to jail. You know, in Mexico, when you go to jail, you're, you're fucked, you know? And yeah. so they shot this dude and then they were like, all right, it's cool, go ahead. Like, we're gonna let you guys leave. And I remember just being like, holy shit. Like, I'm, I was 13 or 14, I think I was 13, like in Mexico with everyone that was on drugs. And then like, I'm busted for a fake ID, you know? Like, I thought it was, and I got home that night and was like, oh, okay, I, that was like, probably not a good idea you know my mom i told my mom about it later you know she doesn't really understand the severity of it but you were yeah, also locked up abroad and you didn't even know yeah. <laughs> i had to go you know i like i i, I had met filth and i i was really into that band and i, I was like i gotta go see filth play sure. um so yeah i've seen a lot of i mean shit. my my, bi my biggest worry was getting the law island railroad home in time for my, you know, my curfew. <laughs> uh, you know, not, not quite going to jail. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I You were in the mix like, really early, though. You were in the mix really early. Like, as soon as you kind of got turned on to punk and hardcore, we're, we're participating. We're going to shows all the time. And we're starting to play as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, like, I remember going see seeing Downcast at um, Gilman Street, and I went with some friends of mine in a in a back of a u-haul truck that they rented like totally we just sat in this gigantic moving truck on a couch and drove to san francisco which is nine hours away you know just to see downcast play and i was 14 and my mom had no idea that i left san diego you know but like i had to go see downcast like i had their seven inch and i was like this is some crazy shit and it was I, and i put they played four songs <laughs> and it was Totally worth it was worth every second of it, you know. I think that it's one of those things too. I think that for you know some of our viewers and stuff like that too. Well, the, the time period that we're talking about, uh, you know, punk and hardcore and touring like more professionally was not really what it is today. It was this like super fully formed thing, and you also didn't have all these tools that we have. Yeah. To to get around, do stuff. I mean, I remember seeing bands all the time that maybe would show up or show up, showed up super late and they could only play four songs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, I came all the way to New Jersey from Long Island or wherever the fuck, Boston or, or whatever. Yeah. So I think that uh, there was a scarcity at that time too. You really had to go and fucking find it, yeah? Yeah, and I, I mean, that's an interesting point that I, I never really like thought about it, but like there was this, there was this time when that band Holy Molar that I was doing was like, maybe going to tour and I, it was a really weird situation because this, it was i think the internet existed but it wasn't like social media where you could just figure shit out so we were supposed to play in um 
this Mexican restaurant in San Diego and we put flyers out and stuff. And then this sucks that this happened, but Gabe's um, sister passed away. So we, we, we canceled the, the shows, you know, obviously. And I remember like kind of being, you know, like being bummed, but kind of like forgetting about that we weren't playing and just like getting on with my, <clears throat> my day or whatever. And it was getting later on the evening and this dude shows up who, who we, we all called Black Spock. He was like a black kid that looked like Spock from El Paso. And he's kind of famous and everybody calls him Black Spock. So it's, I'm not trying to be an asshole or racist or anything, but like, so he shows up at my house and we're like, what the fuck is this guy doing here? You know, and he's like, oh, I came to see Holy Moller play. I took a Greyhound bus from El Paso and I went to Pokies and they said that the show was canceled and they told me to go to your house. So he like, he like got my address and fucking walked to my house and was like, oh, it's cool. Like I'll go back to sleep. I'm going to go sleep in the bushes and uh, at the Greyhound station and go back home tomorrow morning. I'm just like, what the fuck, man? That's crazy, you know? So, Black Spock was not fucking playing. No, he was, he was pretty legit. I haven't seen him in a while, but uh, yeah, he was, he, was, he was an interesting fellow for sure. For real, man. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just wild, like, obviously, you know, doing this for so long, and, uh, you know, we all have, like, these, uh, this cast of characters kind of, like, in our lives at different times that are these sort of tangential people. And I saw that for, for three years. I saw this motherfucker, like, twice a month. Yeah. Entire, my, for, like, from 15, 16 to 19, what happened to that motherfucker, right? So there's always sort of those things. So what was the first band? What was the first band that you were in? What was, like, what was the earliest kind of, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the, the, maybe not the Porsche, but the, you know, <laughs> eat a car out of the garage and I'm gonna I'm gonna play I'm Justin Pearson um my, well my first band was Struggle and I was 15 and 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 we went on tour when when we were when I was 15 and I remember like cruising around with um that's a struggle yeah yeah pun intended it wasn't the best band name but we were called Stru we were called proletariat struggle and we like realized that we weren't really the proletariat because we were all like, I think only half of us actually were working, you know, because we were too young. Like, me and Jose worked at the swap meet, and the other two did not have jobs. So we were like, well, oh, we're not proletariats. Like, we probably should just be called Struggle, you know. And then we went on tour. Rob, um, you know Rob from the Peaches? He lives in New York. Oh, he was, yeah. yeah. I, I know I'm not good friends with him or anything. He's, a, he's one of the best human beings. He works at um, the Bark Animal Shelter. Um, he does all this rad shit for, for animals. Anyhow. He drove us on our first tour in his station wagon, you know, like out of, out, you know, out of California, out of San Diego. It was just a, it was a trip, you know? And then by the time, by one year later, I was 16 and everybody else in the band was all, I, was, I think I might've been the youngest, but everybody could drive. So we, we did, we toured up to Canada and back in, in two cars when I was 16, which is crazy because like, you know, we were all in high school and like everyone's kind of like concerns were like, um, what to do on a Friday night. And we're like, well, we're just going to fucking go on tour, you know? And like, yeah, I, that's, that's like some advanced shit. I feel like <laughs> it was, <laughs> like, it, it made it advanced, but also just, it was totally stupid though. You know, like we were yeah. showing up in places like hoping that there would be a show, you know, like, and we're, I mean, there, there was times where we showed up and there was like nothing happening. Like we were like, Oh fuck, we drove to Sacramento and now nothing's happening, you know? So yeah, but just total crap shoot stuff. And like, Hey, I got this guy's number who does shows. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I think about shit like that too. And, you know, Artie, who does seem by this with me, was in Mind Over Matter and Bad Trip. And he was, you know, uh, more probably like in your generation of, you know, a little bit older than I am. And it's like, I hear about this stuff. And I was in the generation where the internet is sort of just forming as it is today. Maybe by the time I was 18 and 19, you know, like Facebook was coming around and, and dial up was a thing of the past yeah <laughs> it, 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 like this period you know when i was really getting into shows it was super dice and they're like all right cool let's we just got to figure it out book your own fucking life call it yeah. on yeah stuff, right it's um booking your own fucking life and then the, the the dialers that everybody had do you know about those yeah right like they, they would like help you with the pay farms right yeah, so, like, you buy them at Radio Shack. I don't know what they were normally for, but you'd have to change a chip in them. You could, like, mail them to, like, some sketchy person, like Scott Bybin or something, and they change this chip inside of them. So, like, you push the buttons, and it sounds like when you put a quarter in a payphone. So we were, we were, like, calling 
all over the, you know, we were all over the state, all over the U.S. Obviously to to book shows, but then it got gnarly, like where we were like fucking booking show tours in Europe and like for free from a payphone, you know. And it was crazy because you know you'd be on this payphone, it's like enter like or please like insert like eight dollars or whatever, and you're just like D -d 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 -d, you know. And then it's like you're talking for a minute, and it's like please enter another, you know. And you're like fuck, you know, like the the. But it was like free, you know. We were and so we were booking tours and then showing up in Europe and like hoping that those tour, those shows happen is like pretty crazy, you know. Yeah, that's, that's wild. It's pretty incredible. So struggle was a band for a little while, and then what happened after that? Was it Swing Kids that happened? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think uh, like we got out of high school, so like our the singer of Struggle like moved away, and so we we just kind of stopped and started Swing Kids, and that was like that was three of us that were in struggle, you know, without our singer. And, and so that was the next thing, you know, and again, we, that was the first time I went to Europe, like with that band, like when I was 20, you know, it's just so weird to like cruise around Europe. Not, I have no idea how we pulled that shit off, you know, but we did get to Europe and like the, there, we did like some UK shows and then they're like, okay, well, you're going to get this ferry over to France or whatever and do the mainland Europe. And we got there and they're like, no one was there. So we had like two weeks of like nothing. It was super fucked up, you know? Yeah. Um, but we pulled it off. We managed to live somehow. I don't know. And I feel like, um, I think the bands who just had that level of activity, right? And like, you're telling me all this now. And I'm like, this is hilarious. Because <laughs> at the same time, like, I just think these bands are on tour and they're like, doing the fucking damn thing and i'm like so impressed just just by that you know what I mean? and like because you're active you're doing shit and that's that shit that's just hard you know it's just hard and to me when i would look at these bands who were out it was like oh man like they're really doing it and you know on like el camino car crash or like you know whatever what was it like uh just recording uh el camino car crash <laughs> It's it's been you know I feel like out of a lot of the, your the, your musical past it's sort of like this sort of like it's it's a it's a real kind of like you know moment that a lot of people still come back to as much as you know Locust and Dead Cross and Etos are all great it's like a lot of people want to know so what was that kind of process like, like record I mean specifically recording with Swing Kids yeah with Swing Kids. Man, it's weird. I, I hate to like be negative because we were all so young, but like looking back at it, like we sounded like a bad version of Drive Like Jehu. And I think without us realizing it, we all wanted to sound like Drive Like Jehu, you know, but we weren't going to admit it to ourselves or to each other. And I, and, and like to everybody's credit, I think the music is pretty good. I think my vocals and my lyrics are the worst part of the band. And, and I, and I say that like with sincerity, like I didn't know what I was doing. I would, I mean, a lot of it was like, I think I, I think I was really into like Moss Icon and stuff where I would just like repeat like a couple lines over and over and over, you know? And it was like, that's not a fucking verse. And then there's no chorus or it's, or everything's just a chorus. So it was kind of weird. Like, I, I, I wish I could go back and redo it, you know? And then also one of the things that really bothers me is that we never had a lot of money. So when we re record, we never could keep the tape. So we recorded two inch tape and they would dump it to a dat and then they would not give you the two inch tape you, they would just record over it again mm -hmm. I, and i wish that i could have somehow kept that or paid for that and kept those recordings because it would be nice to revisit it and remix it because i we didn't know we, we let we didn't have a producer we just let the engineer like tell us oh yeah you did it right or whatever you know yeah. it's i find this to be really interesting like these sort of early recording experiences and stuff like that because like like you you know you're saying all this in, in fair play right like you're you're young. You've done so many other great things and stuff like that. People fucking love it still, and I feel like it also aesthetically had this big, you know, kind of uh, it, it it made an impression on a lot of folks, and maybe a lot of folks hadn't heard Drive Like Jay who quite yet, or whatever have you. Mm -hmm. So for for you, you're like that, but it's like oh, people are coming at it from a different angle, you know? Um, yeah, I think that that's also a really interesting thing thing to think about because. I don't equate those things really at all. Yeah, I, I wonder about that because I, I think like a lot of times people really are focused on nostalgia and, and I, I think like if I could go back with the knowledge I have now to, to then, like, fuck, I would be so critical of that, you know, like, like I'm, we, it was garbage. Like I'm sure every live show that Swing Kids did was total garbage, you know, because like, 
I don't know. I don't think I don't think our bass player ever had his own gear. I don't think I don't know. You know, yeah. I don't know how it was. It just seems like I think we had different standards then too, you know? And so I mean, especially for me, it was just like we would just once that set started, we would just freak out as much as possible for the next thirty minutes and not really care about like musicianship. And that's fine and that that's that's its own thing in itself, but like I I don't know. Like, it would have been nice to go back and like play a, a venue with a decent PA and like be able yeah. to like hear shit, you know, or whatever. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And I, I think that's also it's an interesting thing because obviously then that started leading up to the Locust, which is really kind of the, the main ditch um, to me, at least. And when, when I first really got into your your musical <laughs> history and stuff like that, it was because of the the Locust, which is um, I had a friend named Katie McDonough, shout out to Katie, she made me fix it. And, uh, it was like all this kind of like, just it was a real, it was a real mix and a lot of like kind of indie stuff or like, like you know, and, and emo and stuff. And uh -huh. Puppy and Deerhead was on the tape. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and, and I sort of fell in love from, from that moment. Uh -huh. Oh, going to that. So Swing Kids was kind of, it was kind of like a bottle rocket to me. And it was like, shoo why was that and then what was the transition into into creating locus you know it, nothing, nothing was ever like planned out i think it was like day to day so so like swing kids were still a band and, and i got approached by by bobby and our old drummer dave to start a band that sounds like crossed out and i was like that sounds fucking cool i want to be in a band like crossed out yeah. and then you know like it never sounded like crossed out unfortunately which well <laughs> fortunately but also unfortunately like i i would have loved to have been in a band like that you know and play, playing bass in a band like crossed out would be fucking sick and so there, there was a, a whole other thing happening with that band by circumstances you know like um dylan who was in trouble moved back to san diego and he was gonna we asked him like let's have him be the singer of this like crossed out kind of band it'll, it'll be super gnarly and rad and then he was like, now nah, I want to play second guitar. Let's get this other dude to sing. And we put a record out with man that split with man is the bastard. And it was kind of like, I don't know, like it kind of seemed like neurosis, early neurosis ish or something. And then like, it took us a minute because the, the other singer, Dave, like was like into Moogs, but he like wouldn't play a Moog on the record. And Bobby and I are like, dude, we need a fucking keyboard player in our band. That shit's sick. Like the Moog is something like, it just sounds rad. Like, let's put, like, moogs and blast beats. Like, no one's done that, you know? And, and then so he was like, nah. And then him and Dylan quit. We're like, we're getting a keyboard player. That's, that's it. And, like, Bobby and I found this realistic moog, which is, like, the cheap version of, of the, the moog license to Radio Shack. And we found one at a pawn shop, bought it, and we're, like, got Jimmy Lavelle, who was in, like, who's in Album Leaf and stuff, like, to be our keyboard player. We're like, you're playing the moog, dude. This thing is sick. And then that was, like, kind of what defined the, the locust, like, with, with, like, a heavy synth thing, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting to me, too, because it was kind of, like, this choice that kind of was born out of the ability of one person to do something. Yeah. Want to do it, but then the concept kind of was born out of that, and then you guys just kept going down that road. Like, yeah, we never, we never would have thought of, of a synth otherwise, you know? Yeah, that's real. That's that's pretty interesting, man. So then, once you guys started doing that, then yeah, because I just honestly the synths are where it really stuck out to me right away. Like, yeah, come on, why? And I was like, whoa, but it was really heavy, and I was like, what is this? And then there's outfits, <laughs> and then we went, and then I was like, I love outfits. Let's go from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so. So that was those sort of aesthetic choices are being happening. You and Gabe, you guys are already kind of like in in, in leaving hanging out too. I love how much this is such like a community thing too. I, I love like it's like yeah, homeboy from Struggle moved away, and then the band broke up, and then another dude moved back, and now he's like yeah, dancing this. A lot of it is so random like that, right? Well, kind of, but like a lot of there's a lot of really strange like. Um, I don't want to say like incestuousness, but like the, the lineage of, of, of like a lot of stuff in San Diego does have those elements. You know what I mean? Even if you look at like a good example would be like Drive Like Jehu where like it was Pitchfork and then it was, you know, R R Pitchfork related and then it was Rock and the Crip related. So there was like this kind of like thing where like everyone kind of worked together, you know? So like to me, like 
struggle, swing kids to the locust all kind of made sense. It all seemed like uh, this sort of like, you know, I don't know, like transition into something, you know, that we grew into. And even before Gabe was in the locust, like, he, you know, we all knew each other and like, it was only a matter of time, you know? And then it would get, Gabe an anomaly in himself because then it was like, oh, we're sitting, we like, cause he played guitar and we're like, dude, we have like the rip, most rippingest drummer in our band that we don't even realize, you know? Like he didn't even realize it. So it was like, again, we had our drummer at the time had to quit for us to be like, oh shit, what are we gonna do? Let's have Gabe try, you know? We, cause we were like, we were like, oh, we're fucked. Like we're losing our drummer. like. Good luck, you know. It's like so, a Van Halen situation, you know. All of a sudden, they're like, <laughs> bam, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, just the way you planned it. But that's that's pretty amazing. And then, you know, I feel like, um, yeah, when when I started hearing about that, I saw you guys play at ABC. I, I saw you guys playing uh, just a lot. What was it like when you started really feeling like, okay, you know what, like. Our band is fucking crazy. It's to me, it's a very left turn, you know, kind of band. But I was like, dude, this is this is like San Diego's got this thing going on, and there's a lot of really fucked up, cool bands coming from there. Sure. And sometimes you get that that feeling. Right now, for me, uh, as far as like the metal world goes and stuff like that, I think like Denver has a lot of amazing bands right now. Special Voice, Blood and Incantation, Chemist, Black Curse. I mean, there's. <sighs> There's a million really cool bands coming out of Denver. Don't know why, but it's a community. Yeah. That's really why. But when did you start feeling like, okay, we're doing this thing in San Diego. You guys are already touring. Okay, when did it start feeling like, whoa, the Locust is starting to take a bit of a life amongst other people that uh, have really, you know, bands past haven't really, uh, really achieved that yet. You know, holy shit. I, I don't know if there was ever that point. It was kind of like, I think we just um, did what we did. And then, you know, and also to like the, the left turn thing really like, cause you know, we were, we we're like coming from like crash worship, Antioch arrow, like, I don't know, whatever, you know, like even like black heart procession, all this weird ass shit that's in San Diego. And so like, we were also like, just being like, Oh yeah, we're just going to do the weird ass shit too. It wasn't like this thing that we were trying to do. It just kind of felt like, Oh yeah, we can be like strange or different and, 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 and not, and it will be, and it seems practical, you know? And so we just kind of did it. And then after it was like, we just kind of like, we're doing the thing. And then all of a sudden we're like, fuck, you know, like we have outfits and these uniforms and we're, and people are like tripping out on all kinds of shit that we're doing. That's cool. Let's just keep going, you know? And we just kind of kept pushing through. Like, it, it wasn't like a, like in retrospect where you look back and you're like, oh, all this shit happened. Like, it just kind of just, was in this increments of stuff, you know, and like constantly changing and evolving. And even now it's still, it's still always changing. Like, sure. it's a, yeah, of course. Uh, one of the things that I was wondering too, I mean, you know, the locus obviously has a pretty, it has a thing that has the outfits, the uniforms and sort of, sort of aesthetic and stuff like that. When did it come to, when, when did that kind of part of the band start growing? I'm always fascinated by those sorts of things, right? Cause you can't separate the two. And to me that presentation was super key to like also creating the spectacle sure. of, of the locust, which is why another reason why I loved it. I think so many other people do. Yeah. I, I think, I think a lot of it had to do with the lineup because it was as soon as we lost our first drummer, Dave and became a four piece, it was a trip because, um, I felt like the four of us that, the, that are the band now are, are like equally, um, equally absurd and like kind of on the same like weirdo page where like our other drummer was wasn't wasn't as like open to like ridiculousness or or like absurdity you know and so like as soon as he split the i think we played one show with gabe on drums and then the second show we played we played in adult diapers in a movie theater you know and we're like that's cool and then and then i think we might have played like a couple a handful more of shows and then we were in uniforms like in Japan, you know, and it was like, Oh yeah. Like th that's like what we should do. And it, you know, and again, I think in retrospect, there's two things. One, we were like taking cues from bands like Devo and um, I don't know, like even like, even like Beatles, we're all in the Beatles and like they, you know, they all like look fucked up and weird and shit or like with the mustaches and the outfits and stuff. And so like, 
that was one element of it or residents that's a good that's a good point too but but it was also that like we were getting a lot of criticism before we had uniforms of the way we looked and we were just like this is fucking lame man like why are why is everybody not everybody why are these small you know this handful of like assholes like you know ha having an issue with the way we look and so it was it's kind of like beautiful uh, it's because you're beautiful that's why but we, <laughs> they were like they were like your pants i'm gonna cut to the chase it's because you're beautiful <laughs> and screw them okay um but that's 100 percent true i just wanted, wanted everybody <laughs> to know justin pearson is beautiful and that's the reason why but to me honestly just going back to even the beginning of the conversation which is you coming in at this cramps point to me, what I loved about The Locust, and when you start bringing up bands, you know, that are like in, in post-punk and no-wave and stuff, <clears> I felt that so hard in the aesthetics more than the music. The music is more like, you know, on some fucked up kind of heavy, you know, blasty stuff that I'm like, okay, like, I'm, I'm digesting this, but there's a reverence to it. And this sort of punk and some, some, some like, ja, 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 like, fuck you-ness to it. Yeah. It was, that was so cool that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm really feeling this because a lot of, you know, I'm from New York. So New York hardcore rules the day. And I, I mean, I talked, to, I talked to Hoya from Madball on Friday, you know? I saw that, yeah. Some of my favorite music on earth, but I'm not that guy. And I yeah. saw myself more in bands like, like yours as, as far as like somebody who can participate or maybe, you know, perform one day or do something like that as opposed yeah. to, you know, I'm like, I'm not from the Lower East Side and like, you know, that's just, you know, in that kind of world. I was more of a voyeur than I felt like as much of a, I could be a participant. But, but what about like, but you guys had weird shit. Like what about like, I don't know, nausea or like born against. Or oh like, yeah, you know, definitely. Like, I mean, there's, there's definitely that. I was just like at that time too, when I was growing up, it was, that was the kind of stuff that was sort of ruling the day. Yeah. But yeah, New York is, it's too vast. There's too many cool bands. Yeah. Cool shit all the time. But, um, and so I just felt that irreverence coming through like post punk and no end and stuff like that. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think like too growing up, like, you know, looking at bands like Sam Hain or, or I don't know, like where there was like an, like the band had a vibe, you know? And like, I think that like, I think that like, um, we were all kind of really into that. Like, you know, you pick any band, like, and they all look fucking cool together. And so you're like, Oh shit. Like let's really hone in on that, you know? And like, make it make it like absurd you know and now and I, because, because like no offense to new york it's not a not a not a it's not a battle or debate but like i felt like maybe on the on the east coast a lot of people were like had other things going on like they were really concerned with the way they looked we're over here we were like man we don't take ourselves seriously like who gives a shit like because it, it, at the end of the day it is only music you know so like i think i think that was it like you could look at like the i don't know like the righteousness of like the dead kennedys you know and like yeah it's fucking super important and super serious but they also like were able to just be like jokesters you know or like silly or what or goofy or whatever and so it's like oh okay we're like you know you look at agnostic front and it was like oh that's just tough guy shit all day long like there's no there's no other like side to that you know sure yeah so I, I definitely agree with you there you know um yeah, there's just an irreverence and there was like a freedom that I just really liked. And I think it ran counter to a lot of things that I felt were kind of very like formal attempts of like hardcore and metal at the time. They were, they felt formal. They felt like I'm putting on my hardcore suit and I'm going to go play <laughs> show or I'm, and I'm like, no, I like the guys who wear the butt gal fits and shit. Like those are, that's the suit <laughs> I want to be in. But one of the things that I, I think that I, I love most about the Locust, and I think this is true about any really good band that, no matter what the setting is, like I saw you guys at ABC No Rio, I saw you guys at a couple of other venues, I think maybe the Knitting Factory, but uh, like the one that was in, in the city, yeah. um, which is Leonard Street, was in, in the financial district at the time. Um, but it was that every time the Locust played, it was your room. And the aesthetic brought it to like your room. Like all of a sudden, no matter if you're in the basement or you're on the big stage, it was like, it's Locust time now. And there's uh, things are sort of happening. I feel like the outfits, everything else, it really contributed to that. That's that's an important. That's an important thing to think about because to me, I, I always looked at it like this: like because there was there was tours, there was plenty of shows where it was not our fucking room. Be, you know, like we toured with Andrew WK, it was terrible. You know, I mean, no offense to no offense to Andrew, but like yeah. his fans 
well, you know, one of the fucking Kit Kat song or a Kit Kat commercial, you know, and like, it was not cool for us. But the thing is, like, I feel like if people are indifferent, then you're, then you failed. So like, we, it wasn't our, wasn't our goal to like, get all these like, I don't know, like, I don't mean to be a dick, but like these kind of like thick headed people to be our fans. The, the goal was to, to get their attention. And, and we did. And that was like, we learned a lot, you know, and also too, like, we had a lot of there was a lot of interesting stuff like having masks on was pretty interesting because people couldn't tell what you were your expressions they don't know like what you're vibing like oh fuck i'm worried or like i'm pissed or I'm, I'm laughing my ass off at the crowd like they have no fucking idea what's going on and that also added to it because then then there is this element of from the audience to be like what in the fuck is going on here the audience that doesn't like you you know so they're they're still going to be engaged to some extent and i think that was like a really almost like performance art you know it was like keep them yeah. captive for 30 minutes and then then let them let it do let them talk all the shit they want they they suffered through half an hour you know better than to do that and go away criticizing us than just bail and be indifferent yeah yeah totally and like and and to some pretty fucking obtuse music compared to something like andrew wk so speaking of irreverence speaking of irreverence we have to talk about the spring air thing okay bigger bruises that is sort of happened for our viewers here if you don't know just somehow found his way onto the jerry springer show um and, and, and i, I used to watch jerry springer every day on my lunch break <laughs> with a kid named dave sandwich and we would go to this pizza place and there'd be two old italian guys five dollars two slices and a soda we would we were able to leave the, the school for lunch when we were juniors and seniors and we watched jerry springer every day and then one day my friend told me it's like dude you know, I, the dude from the look is on like Springer I was like you gotta be fucking kidding me <laughs> um well we were there twice which is kind of weird yes um, the first time was super fucked up the family that was on it before us was like legit and they just beat the hell out of each other for the whole episode and they just sent us home. And the first time it was me and my friend Alicia and then our friend Chris Hathwell, who was the drummer for the Festival of Dead Deer and Moving Units. So it was the three of us and I was a good guy and they sent us home and that was that, you know? And so then like by chance, I don't know how many months later, it, probably not that long later, but back then it seemed long. Um, Scott Bybin, who, who, who was a friend of ours from Philadelphia was out in San Diego we were just kicking it and he like, it was on TV and he, they're like, you, are you in a love triangle? Blah, blah, blah. Like whatever. So he just called and like made a story up on the spot with the four people that were in the house at the time, went back to Philly, totally forgot about it. And then like, I think the day he left or whatever, you know, or the day he got home, he, he like called me at four in the morning. He's like, dude, you're, we're going to be on Jay Springer. And I was like, it's four in the morning. And then like, they called me on the other line and they're like, Hey, this is so and so, and I'm like, oh yeah, cool. But like, we're on California time. Like, it's early, dude. You're gonna have to call me back. So then, anyhow, like, less than like a day later, we were in Chicago filming. It was so weird. Like, just lying our asses off, you know. And it was fucking frightening because they were threatening us. Like, first they threatened us. Like, if we were lying, we'd have to each pay ten thousand dollars, which we didn't have any money then or now. And then the other thing was they like got really pissed at me and like fucked me up in the in the backstage you know because like i blew snot on the floor and then the dude dragged me down on the uh, down the hallway and was threatening me and i was like what like i've seen like fucking people pissing and throwing cake and shit on this on the stage like why what and i was like fuck you and then that was it like because i mouthed off to them so they they did they definitely handed me my ass and they were like we're all off duty pd man like don't fuck with us you know and so i was like all right like this is weird i i thought like I thought I was in too deep. I was like, this is bad, man. I'm going to get, I was, I was pretty scared. I mean, fucking pigs are scary enough, but like Chicago pigs are like not, it was like not fun, you know? And I was like, all right, well, here we go. So, and, I, and it was like, I'm an, an arrogant, like dude that made out with another dude. Like I, there was no reason for them to like, be like, oh, this guy's chill. Like, let's don't beat him up. You know, they were like, I had nothing going for me with these dudes with these guys yeah, they, were, they were just like give me an excuse motherfucker. Yeah, totally yeah yeah it was fucking crazy man but we did it and and then the weird thing is we did it, 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 it me it lives what? in everything. just the, the episode like the whole thing you're just like <laughs> what the fuck is this you know like 
it was pretty stupid. I mean, like, like we did a decent job, you know, like winging it. Like we had like loose, you know, like dude, this is the story and like, don't punch anybody in the face. And like, you know, that didn't work out, but I don't know. Like it, it seemed good. And then the, the craziest part about all that shit was that like a long time passed from when we recorded it till when it aired and it aired during one of those, I don't know if you remember, like in Michigan, they used to have those more than music festivals. So it aired the weekend of a more than music festival and it made it like massive because like everybody at this three day, like, you know, whatever, like, like hipster fucking festival thing. Like all were like, oh my God, this Jerry Springer thing. And then, and then I remember like, the next day like every everywhere i went like in, anywhere like in public people like random people are like jerry jerry I'm like what the fuck you know so i was watching it. it was me outside <laughs> kind of real, chanting that's in, that's just insane though but it really is kind of amazing though because i know people who talked about that and then the locust is already considered like wild band really crazy band and stuff like that then you go off and like oh stunt like this there was that irreverent you know, again, absurdist, situationist kind of vibe that was coming off of you guys. I think I felt like really palpable, you know? It was like, these guys are, I've got to go see the show. What are they even like? I don't even know, you know? So again, I think it lent um, even more uh, kind of like credence, credo to like the performance art aspect of like, well, what you, the entire group was doing. But I, I think it might have like fucked things up a little bit too because it, it got to this point where like, it was more about like the, you are like the crowd going and like talking shit to us. And it, and it got like kind of like to kind of be a bummer. Like we're like, well, first of all, like the heckles were not really that good. You're like, come on, dude. Like this sucks. Like put some effort into it. But like the main thing was like, it was like, it wasn't about like the three like dickheads in the audience that wanted to try to shame us or talk some shit about us. It was like, it wasn't about them. It was about like the show. So we were like constantly just like firing these, you know, I don't know, one liners back at people to shut them down and be like, fuck off, man. Like you're acting like a moron. Just shut the fuck up. And then like, it got like annoying, but then it became this thing where we would start bridging all of our songs together. So there was no, like once the set started until the end, there was no, there's no way for you to have dialogue with us. And that was, that was awesome too. And especially that's, like when we that's an interesting aesthetic choice based off of just you know like there's a practicality to that obviously totally we because well we we were trying to like put the song going back not to bite on John Reese too much but like watching Rock in the Crib he's the best was, was like song after song after that. song you know or like I mean I think maybe the Ramones did it too you know like I mean a lot of band, a lot of bands did it but it's really in, like downtime between songs is like bullshit like you know like you gotta just fucking keep hitting everybody hit them hard and like keep going so like we were trying to shorten you know the, the time between every song and make there be like nothing and then it was then it was like all right now no one can talk shit this is great and yeah you know, and then it became a thing you know then there was this like there's no there's no time to yeah we don't want there to be time to i think that that's kind of you know when i, I going to see it like later on and then when you guys got started slowing things down and other things started happening too it was just kind of like you come and they just obliterate you and you go home like it, it, was, a, it was a good vibe um i'm gonna have to do a little bit of jumping around because we have an hour due to okay i'm so i'm um, we're gonna move off of the locust for for a little bit and i want to talk touch on on retox and, okay. and how that kind of came together. We have played about it many times. Love the band. Glad to hear that Mike is doing much better with his health. Yes. That, um, <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about Retox and how that kind of started kind of coming together and going down. Sure. Yeah. I think like initially again, Gabe from the, you know, the Locust was our drummer and, and him and I were talking about starting a band that was kind of like Headwind City because that what that we only did the Headwind City EP and it was done and so we were like oh we should do something and like that like it's same Vitus with Anthrax on the same night that was the weirdest shit man that was one of the most wild days I think but those at the club those guys were dicks to us man they were like not cool to us which was a bummer but whatever it doesn't matter um if I was old and in Anthrax I'd probably be a dick too so it's it's fine but yeah yeah, we like Gabe and I wanted to start a band that was like Headwind City, and we were like, let's get the dude from Festival of Dead Deer, and that was that was it, you know. And so Retox started, and then 
it, Ray Tops went through a few lineup changes and became its thing. And then we, I don't think we're a band anymore. So it's like, we kind of just let it, let it go and, and, and moved on. But like, yeah, the whole goal was to make a band that was like, just a thrash band. Like you can hear it on the first record. And then, and then we kind of like figured out what we were capable of and, and also honed in on my trains, like goth surf, like fucking weird ass guitar shit, which is like, it's unique in itself and we were like that's the shit like we i don't know brutal surf like christian death i don't know what it was i don't we don't know but we're like that's the guitar stuff and then um that was kind of like what what like defined retox and then and then i think i think we ran its course and like let it go recently so yeah, yeah. but i mean great band did some great tours of course <laughs> really cool shit i really enjoyed the shows that we did Dude. The last time we played at St. Vitus was ripping, man. Like, that was kind of a bummer of a tour, but that show just made the whole tour worth it. It was so rad. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys, and, you know, who come and check out all of our shows and support us, too. Because, yeah. You know, I mean, I hear that a lot. And, I mean, you know, New York is amazing. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a tentpole city. It's a big place. But, like, uh, you know, it, it, it's special for a reason, and a lot of it the people, the atmosphere, everything that goes into it. So, uh, I try and remember that I'm, I'm really lucky to be from where I'm, where I'm from, you know? <laughs> so, obviously, so, you know, the retest thing that's happening and stuff, and then all of a sudden, Dead Cross pops up. Yeah. Okay. We're going to play Lombardo now, Justin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, my, my favorite drummer. Top, and one of the sweetest humans. Uh, Dude, he's so rad, man. What a cool yeah. dude. Like, insane. Um, talk to me about just, you know, how did that all really kind of come together? Because yeah. what the fuck is this? The whole thing is, is like circumstance, you know? I mean, I think <clears throat> I had just recorded with Headwind City and, and um, with Ross Robinson. And so he, like, out of the blue, oh, yeah. me, that's, that guy is something else too, man. Like, motherfucker's like a, some weird guru. Uh, I don't know. He's from another planet. But he was like, hey, I need someone to play bass on this, on this session you want to cruise up like it's the it's the it's the daughter of perry farrell and then like the drummer is dave lombardo and i was like uh, yeah i'll go fucking do that like that sounds sick you know and it was like it was it was like i, I was going through some shit i was like yeah let's I'll, that'll be fun like i'll cruise up there and, and then he's like well do you think your dude from retox will want to play guitar and i was like well yeah i mean i might Mike has this big silly Slayer tattoo on his arm, so I was like, "Yeah, he'll he'll play with Dave, like no matter what it sounds like." So, so it got me and Mike Crane up there in the studio with with Dave, and and then we were tracking on this this young girl's um, this young woman's uh, I don't know, like her record that didn't ever come out, but her name's Poppy Jean Crawford. So we were tracking for her, and then in among that, like Lombardo was like, "Hey man, my band film just broke up." Like, I need to put, like, something together for these three shows. Do you want to put something together? And so we were like, yeah. So we had 12 days. We wrote a really quick set and played three shows. And then, oh, with Gabe. Again, Gabe was in the band uh, initially as a singer. And we played three shows. And then we played, I think, nine or sh something shows. And then started recording an album. And then... And then that was that. It was it was weird. Like it wasn't ever thought out, you know. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Um, that's insane. <laughs> like, <laughs> just that you asked for a session, and it's Dave Lombardo, and then cool. you guys just started doing that. Film played at St. Vitus, and just watching Dave play drums in another context was just so amazing. Like, yeah. Uh, just, just, just incredible, like, to just watch and just see how amazing and proficient he is just across the board. Totally. And, and I think he was probably itching for that kind of experience again, too, right? To I think so. Have, have that other thing that lets him spread his wings a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's like, not just, duh, you know, yeah. but. Well, the stuff that we recorded, I think, is so awesome. I wish it would come out. I don't, I don't think... I love it. it. It like when I when I was up there recording, my mom was like, "What are you doing? Like, who are you playing with? Like, where are you?" Because it was like on the beach, like at Venice Beach. It was really nice. I was like, "Mom, you should, you should check this shit out. It's super rad, you know." And she's like, "Who are you recording with?" And I was like, "All oh, these people." And like, kept asking me like what it sounded like. And I asked Ross, and Ross was like, "He said it sounds like Nancy Sinatra and Halloween, like the the holiday." And I was like, "All right." And so and it kind of does. They're like 
almost like Susie Sue or something like I don't know. Anyhow, it was it's a it's rad. I wish it would come out, but it, it won't. So that was that. But regardless, it got us in the same room, and that ended up becoming the start of of Dead Cross. So I'm I'm super grateful for Ross and for Dave and Mike Crane. Like that was so sick. So that's yeah. interesting. I didn't know that how um, you know fundamental Ross was to the this kind of genesis of that. And you probably met like a guru and stuff like that. Uh, could you talk about just working with him a little bit? Sure. <laughs> Obviously, a legendary producer. <laughs> Yeah, worked with so many different everyone from At the Drive In Blood Brothers to you know Soulfly and, and Deftones. And it's funny because everybody like always talks shit. They're like, "Oh, you, we did the Vanilla Ice record, the metal one," you know. And you're like, "Whatever, dude." Bro, but he did like rips, man. some of the best Blood Brothers stuff. And it, yeah, yeah. I mean, like it was a trip because I like when Headwood City was gonna go record with him. It was like. Um, Everybody was kind of like, oh, let's work with him. And I was like, I'm down for whatever you guys want to do. You just put it together and, like, I'll show up and whatever. And so, like, they're like, oh, yeah, Ross will be the producer. And so um, I remember, like, you know, like, Googling what, like, his deal was and, like, hearing about how he, like, made Robert Smith cry. Or, no, he made uh, the guy from Corn cry and, like, made Robert Smith throw uh, candles at him and shit like that. And I was like, man, he sounds like a total dick. You know, and so, like, we get up there and he's chill as fuck and he's super cool. And a, like, I remember like a day or two went by where I was like, huh, like he's not what I expected. And then at one point we were trying to record this song that we like, cause we even went to Headwind City stuff. I think we only wrote for like a, a short amount of time and then went and recorded. It was, I don't think we all knew the material very well. And Gabe kept messing up this super complicated drum beat. It was like getting really pissed. And like, I remember like Ross throws the door open and he comes in. He's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, or like, no, he said, what the fuck are you doing here? And I was like, oh shit, here we go. Like, we're going to, we're going to, I'm like, he's fucking with my boy Gabe. And like, now we're going to go for it. Like he's, yeah. And he was like, and, and I saw Gabe's face, like kind of be like, oh fuck. He's like trying to check me or also in Gabe's face was like, oh fuck, are you going to check me? Like, let's do this. And then immediately he was like, he's like, no, like, I want to know, like, why are you here? What's, what's, like your heart feeling what is your like um you know like what's happening in your in your yeah like he kept referencing like his heart and your soul and and like um wanted to know like where um the energy was coming from and like but then he kept saying like the mistakes are beautiful i want you to make these mistakes they're beautiful because it brings you to something else and this and that i was like what the fuck is going on and so like it was Jerry, weird thing that, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> it was so weird the whole time and then later on like as this as maybe the session was wrapping up i was like dude so like i heard that you were a dick like what was your deal like you never once were mean to us you were like like he would compliment us to where i was like this is bullshit man the stuff he's saying is like there's no fucking way like we're not that good i don't know what he's saying you know and so he was like you know what like when when corn was here you know they were like 20 years old and they're all on speed and then he's like when Robert Smith was here, like, you know, he, he like, kind of lost it and, like, couldn't write, you know, good shit. And he's like, you guys are different. You're all, like, seasoned and you're, you know, you're, like, you're on fire, you're hungry or whatever, you know, and, like, and it made sense. And I was like, oh, shit, okay, I get it. Like, it wasn't like we were, like, paid to go there, like, from a rec you know, like, a record label or whatever. Like, we, we, you know, we were doing this because we, like, had to, you know, and, like, we had, like, passion and stuff that I think maybe all these other artists might not have had. So... We didn't get scolded, which is rad. <laughs> Great. So Ross, yeah. Ross overall is cool, and he wants your soul to be okay. And if your soul's all right, he will not scold you. So we, Dude, it was, we, we figured yeah. it, we figured it <laughs> out. Deal. I'm glad that your soul's right. So we got six minutes left. Um, okay. I want to uh, delve in. There's a little question box down here, guys. We're going to do a little rapid fire question uh vibe oh here's one how did the locust get introduced to john waters um we had a mutual friend i don't know we had a mutual friend and he and he like got into it like uh like a there was this there was this um comedian named isaac ramos it was like a friend of his and we were friends with isaac and somehow he like gave him our cd and then we, we ended up getting on the soundtrack to cecil be demented and then that was it you know that's cool. There's actually, oddly, uh, uh, a question about my pinky ring. This is a ring that my wife gave me from the Great Frog, if anybody wants to know. Oh, that's pretty rad. Yeah, no doubt. I always wear a pinky ring, man. It's, uh, 
it's a Latino uh, must have over the age of 30. <laughs> Justin, what does AOTKPPA stand for? I can't tell you. You're going to have to ask Joey for that. Uh, I answer. love that. I love that. We have secrets here sometimes, you pieces of shit. You can't have every answer that you want, okay? Um, let's see. Oh, somebody actually mentioned in the comments here. It says, talk about some girls. I forgot. Some girls. Like, what if I'm a turd? Uh, yeah, some girls was a, was a thing. Yeah. And it was a good, good super, uh, another bottle rocker, like a short-lived band, but. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they were already a band. They put out a, the first seven inch before I joined, and then I, <clears throat> they played one show without me, and then I joined the band, and then we played, and I guess I ruined it. I don't know, but like we played, and then we, we kind of just, it kind of fizzled out. You know, I think everybody started yeah. doing different things and, and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, that was, it was fun while it lasted. It was cool. Yeah, the, the San Diego, uh, the, the San Diego period, uh, <laughs> mostly I saw there. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, this is just a compliment, but it's a nice one. The Dillinger Trash Talk Retox Tour is still one of my favorite tours of all time. That was fun. It was it was a it was a tough one, but that was fun for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's like a, a wild. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We got we got we got a couple there. So now we're gonna go to kind of my final questions, which is really just. So you're from San Diego. So if you had to get five San Diego records that I would have to kind of listen to, or you would have to keep with yourself for quarantine, give me five records from around there that you would you would want to tell. So like San Diego bands. Uh, well, the first Drive Like Jehu record, of course. Um, Brilliant band, incredible. Yeah, the. Um, the 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 I, I don't know what it's called the the Crash Worship out al album or CD it was like a CD that was like uh, with this copper thing on the cover that they all peed on I don't know what it was called that album um, probably Unbroken Life Love Regret um, damn I don't know like can that's I throw a Tom Waits one in there I mean he's from here I, I don't know if yeah that's dude, whatever, whatever you feel is your list it's <laughs> <I'll think> it. <laughs> not mine um. Battalion of Saints. Um, Saints, that's a great one too. That's five right there. You, okay, clear <laughs> the hurdle. Like it's hard. There's so many things I kept thinking. Like oh, oh, like should I say that or you know whatever. Don't like, worry about it. Don't wake up at tonight. It's like midnight <laughs> thinking about this. It's just like an off the off the top. So we got two minutes left, Justin. I just want to thank you for coming on. Oh, uh, thanks. It's real fucking pleasure. It's always great to see you when you're playing and, and you know, obviously in this, in this form as well to keep us kind of going with stuff. Any yeah. parting words for anybody? Anybody, any advice for people in quarantine? Anything you want to say before we sign off? Well, I look forward to playing St. Midas again. It's one of the raddest places and, like, it's always a pleasure to see you and I really do think that that venue is, like, it's like Gilman Street or the Che Cafe or the Smell or ABC No Rio. It's one of those places that has that special energy. And I, I, I can't wait for humans to be back to that kind of like thing again, you know, like to be able to experience that energy again. I, I really, I really look forward to that. I, I, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. And I, I can't wait till we all are able to share our energy, not in these little boxes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, I definitely can speak for everybody that's watching now and uh you know just can't wait to uh see you and you, all your various incarnations get back to work so take care and uh you. you know we'll have to do this again sometime too because there's there's still a whole lot to cover but <laughs> all right take thank care. you so much man i appreciate it be easy bye